Good afternoon. Welcome to the second episode of the second season of COVID-19 Updates from Singapore. I'm David Allen. I'm your co-host and here today with my fellow co-hosts, uh, Professor Dale Fisher and Dr. Louisa Sun. Thank you for joining us today on the eve of a public holiday. Uh, just as a quick reminder, there's in the chat link, uh, there will be a, uh, excuse me, in the chat box, there'll be a link uh, that allows you to submit uh, topics and uh, of interest, uh, videos and uh, songs, pandemic songs of the months that you'd like to contribute or any questions you might contribute for future episodes. Tonight's episode will uh, have a typical format. We'll begin uh, with uh, Dale uh, updating us on epidemiology. Uh, Louisa Sun will then speak to us about a topical event uh, of everyone's interest. Uh, we have a guest with us uh, that'll uh, speak to us about uh, a little bit about uh, what's going on with uh, uh, finding the origins of COVID. Uh, and then I'll uh, provide uh, an update on uh, vaccines. Um, and so it's now my pleasure to ask uh, Dale what, uh, what he's gonna be sharing with us tonight. <laughs> I think you just said it all, David. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah, I'll be doing the usual epi updates, but I've uh, got a good uh, friend I've known, known for over 10 years uh, through Goan. He's going on the origins of the, of the virus mission next month, so uh, he'll be coming along later for, for a little chat. And Louisa? I'll be speaking of a topic that uh, you know has gotten everyone in a frenzy. It's been on all over the news today as well. Some of you may be able to guess what it is, um, but I will leave the topic itself for later. Great, very good. Well, there's been a couple questions from our last episode that I think are of interest to, to everybody watching. Uh, one of them is uh, was from a colleague in Romania asking, what was it uh, that Singapore did well to control its epidemic curve and limit the damage to its economy? Dale? Uh, I'd always start by saying done well so far, um, and it wasn't without a few a few uh, twists and turns along the way. But uh, David, it's really about doing everything. Uh, not it's not just masks, it's not just contact tracing, it's not just isolation and quarantine. It's uh, it's everything. It's the the community buy-in, the the leadership, uh, a, a nimble nimble response. Um, but mind you, there's uh, as, as I'll point out in the in the epi side, there's uh, plenty of countries boasted that recently and, uh, and are struggling now. Uh, Luisa, uh, Vlad Nikolai asks, are there studies looking at the long-term consequences of COVID-19? Well, um, yes, definitely there are a lot of studies, I think, ongoing. And But, you know, as with everything with COVID so far, I think what we know at this point is just that, you know, this is another very complex um, and heterogeneous condition. So I think we, we de there are definitely studies going on. And I think we do need a lot more studies, you know, to be able to understand the full complexities of the condition. Yeah. So, uh, but I understand also that this is something that, you know, a lot of people may be very interested in. So we may put together something for one of the future episodes. Please stay tuned. Great. Looking forward to it. Thank you. All right, Dale, over to you for uh, Epi Update. Great. Well, uh, yeah, there's a fair bit to, to report. Uh, th this, this curve is uh, showing slightly increased numbers of, of deaths. You can see in the, in the last 24 hours, uh, uh, eight and a half thousand deaths, still half a million uh, new cases a day. And you can see that uh, US, UK has, uh, has moved into second place, Russia. So let, let's go through um, each of those in, in a little bit more detail. You can see from the, the six uh, regions of, of WHO what the curves are, are looking like. So uh, the Americas are definitely going the wrong way and you don't have to turn the TV on for more than a couple of minutes to understand some of that. Europe, um, the deaths are, are, are sort of there, perhaps on the increase uh, with cases coming down, that's an expected lag. Southeast Asia doing well, Eastern Mediterranean looking okay, Africa going the wrong way and, and Wipro doing what we do. So um, again, to, to look through some of those, it's uh, what, what's remarkable on this is that uh, US is, is really, um, uh, leading all the indicators, if you like. The, the number of new cases in a week has been over one and a half million and this 5,000, just, just keep an eye on that 5,000 per million population over a, over a week. Um, and we'll compare that as we go through others and this, this death rate of 55 as well. So, so really US is, is far and away 
um, compared to the others leading the pack uh, and also in deaths. Um, Canada's here, they're, uh, so we know lots of US is uh, talking about lockdowns, but they're in a, in a political, um, I guess, uh, midpoint. Um, Canada is, uh, Ontario, the, the most populous state will be, be locking down uh, from Saturday, the day after Christmas. Um, uh, that, that'll affect about 14 million people. That'll be a 28 day lockdown in the south and a, and a 14 day lockdown in the north. Um, similar things are happening in Quebec. Um, so let, let's dig into to US a, a little bit more. You remember this was like a, a third wave, right? But the, the, the size of the, of the current transmissions in the US has, has really made these first and second waves virtually uh, not measurable. There used to be a significant fall from that, that peak at the beginning of, uh, at the beginning of, of, of their first uh, outbreak, this, uh, their first wave. This came down significantly, but now it looks flat because we're up at this, uh, at this, uh, what is it? Uh, well, yesterday, 232,000 cases, new cases in a day and three, nearly three and a half thousand deaths. So, so this is uh, extraordinary. These are the new cases and these are the deaths. So again, obviously going, going the wrong way. In total, 19 million people PCR positive, 335 uh, uh, cases positive. California has got the most cases with about uh, 2 million altogether and 23,000 deaths. Uh, Texas and Florida are also heavily affected. Um, New Jersey's got the highest death rate per million um, at, at 200. 200 per million, think about it. That's two per thousand people have died in New Jersey. Extraordinary. And that's just ahead of New York and Massachusetts. The the lowest rates are about one tenth of that in, in Vermont and Hawaii. Um, and just to compare this death rate, so uh, this is uh, September 11, um, 2,977 were, were, were killed. So we're, we're seeing more than that uh, every day. Pearl Harbor was 2,400 in, in one event. World War I was 116,000 and World War II was 291,000. So, so the number dying from, from COVID is, is really dwarfing uh, all these other uh, catastrophes for the US. So I just wanted to put that in, in some sort of perspective. Uh, going to Europe, um, it's all about the UK. Um, you can see the, the, these cases, I'll speak about it in a bit more detail, but uh, 33,000 cases a day and 200 deaths a day. Um, and here's the, the shape of the other curves. So you can see uh, tend to be going up, some are coming down because the effect of their, of their lockdown is starting to, to come into place. So, so here's UK, you can see this is a, a big bold red um, and, and their, their epi curve is this um, sort of uh, bimodal, I'll show it in the next slide. Um, it's, uh, but as we look down here, there's uh, high numbers of, 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 uh, of deaths per million. Remember the US was, was 50s. Um, so, so this is what we haven't seen in, in Europe before is, is, is this death rate uh, and particularly Germany, uh, which has got very strong ICU capacity. Um, that, that's now in, uh, increasing in, the, in terms of, of deaths. Also uh, Netherlands, Czechia, um, they're, they're, they're also got very high numbers of cases um, from uh, just per, per, per million. Um, I had uh, one question that asked, uh, what caused Europe to become the hot zone of this pandemic and, and what can she do from here? Um, and and I, similar to my, quest, my answer about Singapore, you, you just need sustained community buy-in, you need agile governments, you need to learn from new information. Um, to still be arguing about masks and things like that is, is quite ludicrous. We learned that at the end of March. Um, I, I know of one country that does self-contact tracing. So uh, the, the actual person with the disease is expected to do their own contact tracing. Um, no, I, I don't think anyone in Europe isolates all their positive cases. So, so really the, there's a reason why uh, once you take away the lockdowns, they, um, they trigger back up. So I hope that uh, answers that question. So here's UK and I know Louisa's gonna talk about this later, but. Uh, but this is uh, 
the, the, the first wave, if you like, and the second wave, which was coming under control. But then the last four weeks, it's really um, flown up. Um, now, we still don't know if that's because of a, a more infective virus or because it's um, uh, because of behavior. But um, nonetheless, there, there, there is some evidence uh, about the virus, which, um, which, uh, which Louisa will explain why a change in the spike protein has led to this. These, these are trucks being held up, not, not being allowed to, uh, to leave the country, which means they can't come into the country, which means they can't fill up, uh, fill up this. So, so it's, uh, I find it a little bit remarkable that we're now um, modifying our responses based on gene sequencing. Uh, I would have thought just the, the principle of stopping the virus would have been enough, but, but there you go. Uh, look forward to hearing more about that from, from Louisa. Um, and again, you can see here the rest of Europe cases uh, so some are going up, some are going down, depending on what stage of, of lockdowns, really. Uh, and deaths, there's lots of red here. And that's because of that lag, which uh, people tend to die two or three weeks after uh, getting infected. So, so you might see these, these are blue, but these are red. And that's because of the, that, that lag. Uh, if we go to Southeast Asia, um, ag again, uh, I won't talk too much about this. It's uh, generally uh, India, which is, uh, has uh, struggled for so much of this time, St still a lot of cases, but, uh, but, um, but, but in terms of cases per million, remember US was, uh, was like 5,000. So, so pretty, pretty good in, in this uh, part, of, uh, part of Asia. Um, and, and deaths per million population, again, quite low. So, so kudos to most of them. Uh, here's um, Thailand. Uh, I'll just switch to Thailand for a minute. And yes, I'm going to use some emojis because uh, I can and I was in the mood. Thailand has shocked us all, um, having done such a remarkable job throughout, largely through, through border closures uh, uh, and, and vigilance at borders, I must say, has had this... Uh, this terrible spike over the last uh, few days. Um, and it's another example, I, I'm afraid, of, of migrant workers and, and dispossessed people uh, being vulnerable. So, so this happened uh, in this Samut Sakon um, province. Uh, it's a shrimp market called Talud Klang Kung. Apologies to the tires in the audience. Um, but this is just, just near Bangkok. Um, and uh, and it's since spread to probably seven provinces last, last I read. It was a, a seafood vendor um, that, that tested positive um, and uh, contact tracing was started. This, this was um, a very heavily uh, mi uh, managed by migrant workers uh, and uh, they're now actually over a thousand cases and 90% of them are migrant workers. So there's been massive uh, contact tracing, testing tens of thousands of people to try and get this under control um, from our experience in migrant workers and, and the, the living conditions, it's, it's gonna be a, a challenge. Um, they're, they're mostly from, from Myanmar. So this, is, uh, this was a couple of days ago in Bangkok Post. So lot, lots of vigilance around the, the border areas. This is Myanmar. This is uh, the, the, the epicenter for the, the new Thailand outbreak. It's only a couple of hundred kilometers to the borders. Uh, and and this this actual border region is about 2,400 kilometres long. Um, they normally allow people over, but they have uh, designated quarantine facilities. Um, but uh, nonetheless, they're still fairly porous, and and uh, it is said that illegal immigrants is is a big part of this problem coming over from Myanmar uh, and, and often working. Um, so. The usual drills happening, night, night curfews, uh, lockdowns, closures of, of various things. So, so, so good luck to, to, to Thailand. Um, here's some, some visions from, from the media. But, but up until this time, it was really uh, very few cases and, and virtually all imported since this initial cluster. Uh, let's go to the Eastern Mediterranean region again, just, just briefly. Um, we can see uh, that uh, Iran's uh, seen the most. Uh, there was a paper in the Lancet ID this uh, oh, last week um, that uh, Iran's had 1.1 million diagnosed. We know that's a great 
underestimate and also 54,000 deaths. But uh, the overall seroprevalence was 17%. Um, in some of the previous epicenters, Rushed and Com, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, seroprevalence is, is 78, 72 and 58% uh, respectively. That, that was attributed at the time to holiday movement, uh, very similar to what's happening in the US now with, uh, with Thanksgiving and then Christmas. So let's move um, along. Uh, oh, here's Saudi. They've another, yet another wealthy country that's, uh, that's obtained uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and has started vaccinating. Bit of a concern, this all this uh, uh, inequality of getting vaccines. Uh, Africa, likewise, South Africa is uh, starting to, uh, to surge again. Um, you can see there with both uh, deaths and, uh, and cases on the way up and, and, and Africa is, uh, is having some, some difficulties at the moment. You can see most countries showing trends uh, the wrong direction. Um, so let's come to Western Pacific region. Um, so let's, uh, let's flip past that. You can see there's some countries definitely having trouble. Philippines on the way down, nice to see. Uh, Japan and Malaysia, um, I'll, I'll talk about those and Korea in, in a little bit more detail shortly. But, but by and by still, the new cases per million population, quite low. Uh, new deaths per million population, again, very low compared to to Europe and, and the Americas. Um, so there, there's some, some sad points. This was another cluster, uh, Sydney, um, Northern Beaches, if you've been there, it's a lovely part of the world. Uh, the, the index case was unclear. I think there, there are around 100 uh, cases from this cluster now. So that they, they believe it was another uh, breach in quarantine, um, sorry, in, in travel quarantine hotel quarantine for, for imported cases. Um, and it got, got up to here. There, there was a couple that uh, uh, had symptoms, went for a test. Uh, rather than waiting for their results, they went to their, their bowls club and, uh, and a pub. And uh, that, that turned into a bit of a, a super spreader event. So, so basically all this uh, part of Sydney, in fact, even down south and, and further west, um, they've got uh, on their website some... Uh, what appear fairly fairly complex instructions, but uh, if you're only looking at where you live, then it it'll become clearer. Uh, you may have heard of this case in in Taiwan, uh, which was a, a Taiwanese uh, woman with a, a, a New Zealand pilot um, who who'd come back um, and uh, is said to have not worn a mask, and uh, and then. Uh, so the thing is, pilots need to be bubble wrapped, right? All, all these um, air crew, uh, if they do travel, either turn them around and bring them straight back, or if they're in a country of high prevalence, if they don't want to be um, uh, in quarantine when they come back to Singapore or Taiwan or any, anywhere, they have to be very carefully uh, managed so that they're not actually mixing with, with the population in that other place. So, so this was clearly a breach of, of that process. Um, and uh, this, uh, I understand there's some repercussions against the, uh, the New Zealand pilot, as, as you could imagine. Uh, and then, of course, there was this, uh, this wasn't a breach in, this is the Mandarin, uh, or, uh, Mandy, Mandarin Orchard. Uh, this wasn't a, a breach of, uh, of traveller to, um, to local. Uh, this was travellers to travellers. And as you know, it was... Uh, in the first couple of weeks of November, it looks like there was uh, a cluster identified. They were they were gene uh, they were sequenced and found to be be very similar. Uh, so there's an investigation going on there to work out how this this cluster occurred. But um, these are you, you expect these places to be hotspots, and um, and we need to stay ever vigilant in them. Uh, I was also asked some questions about. Um, about island nations, uh, and you can see there's many here that uh, that don't have have any disease. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was put to me: was it the humidity? Uh, no, I don't think. I think it's more likely border controls. And border controls work if you do them well, but of course they wreak havoc on on some of these um, nations: Tonga, Samoa, Cook Islands, Nauru. A lot of these places really rely heavily on tourism, so. So there's, uh, there's a price you pay for those strict border controls. 
Um, let's talk to these very disappointed imagery, uh, David. Um, so these are the countries I, I said last month uh, we'll need to keep a really close eye on. It'll be very interesting to see what happens. Um, so, uh, so Hong Kong, you can see maybe coming down now. Japan in the last month or two hasn't. Uh, Malaysia, unfortunately, still tracking upwards, as is South Korea. Um, so South, South Korea has uh, had about 53,000 cases altogether and 750 deaths. Now they're having about 20 deaths a day after these really prolonged periods of, of, uh, of good control. Hospital beds are short, um, uh, working with private hospitals to increase ICU beds. Gatherings of five or more are now banned. Um, and uh, weddings and funerals are still allowed up to 50. They're closing ski resorts and tourist attractions. Hong Kong, um, still quite low in the spectrum of things, between 50 and 100, but uh, they're having about one or two deaths a day. Um, they were announced today that there'd be enough uh, vaccine for the whole population uh, early in the start of next year. Uh, Japan's having about 40 deaths a day with... Uh, with this number approaching 3,000 cases every day. Um, and Malaysia is having uh, uh, between two and seven deaths a day is their rolling average, um, with altogether around 100,000 cases total now and 450 deaths. So, so these countries were iconic in, in many ways for controlling it without harsh lockdowns. Um, so anyway, I'm very disappointed looking at the imagery. Um, so uh, let, let's go to Singapore. Um, there's only been one case detected through surveillance. All the rest are, are imported cases. Um, and uh, I, I think just the, this smattering of one here, here and now, I think we should be vigilant. And I think anyone with, with an ARI, acute respiratory illness, do make sure you go and get tested because there just seems to be a, a, a little bit hanging around. Um, Okay, here's the graphs we're very familiar with, and this just shows what I just said, the huge number of imported cases, uh, uh, which is a, a reflection of what's happening outside of Singapore. Community cases, negligible. Dorm residents, uh, just, just uh, very occasional. Uh, and here's the current state of affairs. Um, there's only, this is up one more death since we last spoke on, on November 27, bringing it up to, to 29 cases. But, We've got no one in ICU, 30 in the wards, 97 in care facilities, and a total of 29 deaths, 58,000 altogether. So that's another, that's the last EPI update um, for the year. Um, David, would you like it back or should we throw to Louisa? Let me just ask you a quick question, Dale, because uh, it's, it's something interesting. I was watching BBC last night and then you mentioned it again. Um, about uh, recognizing that there needs to be further measures put in place, but they delay them for a few days. You mentioned, I think, uh, Monter uh, Montreal and uh, Quebec uh, waiting until the weekend. Um, what do you think about that? I think uh, London is doing that as well, or someplace in, in England. I, I think you've got to get community buy-in. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, per personally, I wouldn't, uh, I don't think it's a big deal. Um, I think it's a it's a circuit breaker measure to try and bring things down. And whether you start uh, start tomorrow or whether you start uh, two days later, I'm not sure. It's uh, uh, I, I think it's good. It, it's yeah. it's respecting the, the the needs of the community socially. Great. All right. Thanks, Dale. Uh, Louisa, please over to you. Okay. So I guess it's not a surprise what yes. I'm going to talk about. Um, we'll just go right in. So um, I suppose um, if I were to take a guess as to what everyone is kind of feeling, you know, hearing about this uh, UK variant or this new um, newly mutated virus, it's going to be a mixture of confusion, worry and fear, probably. Um, and a lot of you probably, you know, in Singapore woke up to this today. So while we've still got a lot of things to figure out, I have to say that I'm no, I'm no virologist, but what I've tried to do is just sift through the massive amount of information that have come out and hopefully put together something that will all help us to, you know, digest and find out a little bit more about, you know, what this virus really is or what this mutation really is. 
So um, before we dive too deep, um, I'll just take you through a few simple terms and concepts to follow the discussion a bit better. So this is actually what um, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral genome looks like if you kind of you know, put it on a di diagram and uh, uh, draw it out. So what we can see is um, a viral genome basically contains, you know, the genetic information um, and instruction manual of an organism and every li living organism has it. So um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a single strand RNA virus and um, it's comprising of just short of 30,000 nucleotides and these are represented by four letters. So each of these colored bars here is actually um, one gene for this virus and each gene is composed of a different number of nucleotides. And at any point, each of these nucleotides can actually undergo a mutation. And actually RNA viruses in particular are already known to have a higher rate of mutation. And for the SARS-CoV-2 virus in particular, the S gene, which is the spike protein, uh, which codes for the spike protein region actually um, has a higher mutation rate than any of the other genes in particular. And now um, when we say genome sequencing, it's really basically reading the whole um, genome of the virus and decoding and putting it into letters one by one. So practically how this helps scientists from the beginning is that um, it's, we get to know, you know how the virus is spreading, if there's any local community spread versus imported cases and where are clusters in the country. And um, it also helps us to kind of track symptoms and severities of disease that are associated with particular strains of the virus. Um, and lastly, of course, you know, we're all concerned with this as well. It helps us to develop and keep vaccines up to date. The next term I want to introduce is actually just a phylogenetic tree. And this is in simple terms, just basically think of it like a viral, uh, sorry, a, a family tree of a virus, right? So uh, what we can see here um, is, you know, many, many branches. And this kind of shows us how each strain of the virus was related, you know, to its previous ancestor and how it all relates back to the original virus, which is, you know, the Wuhan virus here. So um, this phylogenetic tree can actually come in different forms and uh, diagrammatic representations. And this is just the branch version. And then we can see how the virus evolves over time. But it's also important just to know here that a lot of this is based on hypothesis because tracking viral origins is actually something that is quite difficult. So um, this may not be based on fact, it's just a hypothesis of where the virus has gone and uh, where the virus has been and where the virus has gone. But it's still very useful to know because if you've watched through the animation, then um, um, this, you can see how it's, you know, helps to essentially map or track a virus's journey. So lastly, um, this is something, you know, uh, this term has also been floating around and that's a lineage. So simply put, this is kind of synonymous with saying a viral strain. There's um, different criteria used for different viruses and how then the lineages are grouped and defined. But essentially, it just puts the phy uh, phylogenetic tree into letters, numbers, or a mixture of both. And it kind of, you know, gives a code for uh, what strain the virus is. Um, and this new UK strain falls under the B1.1 lineage. Um, and so we'll see more later. And just fun fact, um, these are actually the common Singapore um, virus lineages. Okay, so now we get to some storytelling. How did this new var uh, variant strain really rise to stardom? So if you look at this graph here, it's not really hard to appreciate that something is very wrong and it should appear alarming to anyone looking at it because um, without even knowing what the absolute numbers here, you can tell that there is a sudden quite dramatic increase in the numbers of COVID-19 cases over a relatively short period of time here. This is showing in South, um, Southeast uh, UK. So um, now, remember we talked about um, genome sequencing. The UK has also actually been quite diligent in um, doing background regular genome sequencing for about 5 to 10% of all its COVID-19 cases. But with this surge, the genome sequencing and analysis was further enhanced. And so this is how, you know, this new vi variant strain was found. More than 50% of the new cases here were actually caused by the same newly mutated virus. So, and this is the new strain that you've been hearing about, right? So now each of these names, um, maybe less so of the second, have been used quite interchangeably in the media, but they're all referring to the same virus. The name that we use for ease of conversation is the UK variant. The official name though is the SARS-CoV-2 VUI, which stands for Variant Under Investigation 2020-12-01, which is basically the year, month, and the version of this new variant. 
So, um, and if we were to use the other com common scientific um, nomenclature, then this virus belongs to the lineage B1.1.7. In particular, though, what's strange or concerning about this variant, uh, this variant is um, that it actually contains a very high number of mutations. It has a total of 23 mutations, and uh, um, many of these mutations are actually um, in the spike protein region itself. There's, an actually, uh, there's actually an unusually high proportion of mutations here. So we can't really move on here before asking how and why did this new variant appear? Um, is it just you know, a natural accumulation uh, of mutations over time or a random event? Um, and truthfully, neither of these seem likely because um, we do expect about two nucleotide mutations in a virus per month. And so the large number of mutations seen here really kind of seems to far outrun this uh, molecular clock that we expect. And, you know, we know that a lot of mutations, uh, a lot of viruses may have been uh, originated from animals. But, um, and, you know, recently, I'm sure we all also remember the Denmark mink outbreak. But so far with this strain in particular, there doesn't seem to be any particular animal links found so far. So perhaps um, what's postulated as the most likely event for now is that a patient with a weakened immune system has carried the infections for a much longer time than usual. And this has therefore accelerated the number of immune escape mutations as the virus was replicating in the host. And this is the original strain that has then infected other people. But nothing is really conclusive yet, so we'll also still have to wait for more information to come through regarding this. So now back to business, um, a quick Google search will actually yield you too many results, you know, to really comfortably process. Um, and many of these are actually quite scary looking headlines because they mention, you know, uh, consistently things like more contagious, increased transmissibility, um, you know, um, very concerning. But um, the reasons for this um, is not completely unfounded. Um, and as Prof. Dale kind of alluded to earlier as well, they really stem from you know, a few mutations of note in this new variant strain. Um, but I do want to clarify that you know, um, these um, increased transmissibility isn't a direct result of a change in the viral property itself. It's not that the virus can suddenly jump further or navigate through a crowd, but it's really because of the mutations that we see in particular um, regions of the virus here that enables it to firstly uh, bind to human cells more easily, as well as then enter the cells more easily. So then, um, and it can also help the virus to evade the immune system. So this just means that, you know, there is less amount of virus that is needed to, uh, for an individual to become infected. And when this person becomes infected, they actually produce a higher number, a higher amount of virus, and then therefore they can spread this virus more easily as well. And therefore these two put together result in increased transmissibility. Um, and there is another area of concern because of the high number of mutations in the S gene, uh, which codes for the spike protein, that some RT-PCR test kits that rely on detecting this gene alone can then fail. But on the other hand, it's actually not unusual for test kits to also, oh, sorry, it's actually not usual for test kits to only rely on one gene to detect the virus. Um, usually there are two to three genes in each test kit. So a positive result can still be obtained from detecting one of the other genes. Um, but so far, what is fact and what is myth? While we don't have all the answers yet, uh, what we should also know that a lot of these concerns so far come from theoretical knowledge and the findings are confined to a lot of lab studies and animal studies. So some of these mutations here on its own are not new. We've seen them in previous uh, strains of the viruses as well. But so far, we haven't really seen any cat catastrophic effects, um, you know, on this virus in the population and how it's spread so far. So while we know there are multiple targets, um, you know, that the vaccine uses, and um, hence even knocking out one or two antibody responses to this particular uh, mutant strain shouldn't diminish its efficacy. And, you know, while I did mention that, you know, uh, was seen on the numbers chart earlier was alarming. Um, this sudden surge uh, 
we can't be sure that it's really only due to this variant strain of the virus as well. So this curve looks almost exactly like the one that I showed earlier, but it's not UK's curve. It's actually a, uh, it's the epi curve of the US. And so we can see that, you know, certainly one variant strain is not the only thing that can cause a surge and spike in numbers. So um, it's also true that it's unlikely that, you know, in this particular part of the UK, um, the residents didn't start suddenly all deciding to abandon their, abandon their masks and, you know, not follow any um, movement restrictions or social distancing rules. But we also know that a super spreader event can really just come from one single breach. Um, and especially given that, you know, movement restrictions in the UK at that time were actually not at the highest tier, they were at tier two. So, you know, and this is the holiday season. So we do expect much more, um, a much increased social gathering and social mixing in the first place. So what's to say that, you know, this spike in numbers is not uh, also an event or on, uh, a result of a few super spreader events. So um, this is just, you know, to put forth that the percentage that we see that's uh, put across, uh, this new variant is reported to increase transmissibility by 70%. It might really not you know, depend on only one single factor, which is this variant strain. Um, and this 70%, putting it into another perspective, if we're looking at the R0, it increases the R0 from 1.1 to 1.5. So this is perhaps not too unmanageable in itself, if we're still, you know, being very vigilant and maintaining the public health measures that have been emphasized on, you know, as really the way to stop the spread of the virus. And this really brings me to my next point, um, which is, you know, the most important point that I really wanted to emphasize on in the talk so far as well. This virus will has mutated before and it will keep mutating. And, you know, so today you also may have seen some reports of a South African variant known as 501.v2 uh, um, that I won't have time to address. But regardless of this, the measures that we've all stressed on incessantly at this point um, is, you know, that they are still important and remain crucial and effective in containing the pandemic. And mutations don't render these public health measures ineffective. Conversely, no matter how weakly transmissible a virus is, um, if you're in a crowded indoor room with you know, a few infected people coughing away without their masks on, a few other people in that room are going to get infected. So we should continue to be smart and protect ourselves um, and our families with what we know works and with what we know to be effective in stopping the spread of the virus. And none of this is new. So it also, it also may offer some reassurance to know, though, that not all mutations um, in the virus will turn out to be favorable to the virus itself. Okay. And in fact, one of, this, uh, one of the mutations in the UK vari variant here, which is the ORF8 gene deletion, was actually seen much earlier in the Singapore strain itself. Um, and it was postulated that this uh, mutation in particular actually caused less severe symptoms in the patients. But because we managed to then contain the virus, in fact, the strain died out before we could really properly uh, further study it. Um, but I guess not, that's not a bad thing. And it really only proves, uh, you know, to reinforce the point again, that we know what works and it still works. So we kind of sound like old broken records at this point, but really it's worthwhile emphasizing that the life-saving measures are simple things like wearing your mask, washing your hands, and really simply complying with social distancing rules. So we want everyone to be updated and aware about this new UK variant and any other new variant that may, you know, be upcoming and are significant. But as with each new step of development in you know, COVID-19 and the cause of the pandemic so far, we also don't want mass panic or indulgence of sensationalized headlines over the facts. Um, much, much more information is going to be coming out over the next few days and even the next few weeks or months. But you know, do be careful what you're reading and make sure that you're referring to trustworthy um, sources of, of information as well. So with that, I hope everyone really has a happy but safe holiday season. Thank you, Louisa. Um, Thank you. And I think that's the point, isn't it? That uh, we should be trying to stop the virus, not different uh, gene sequences, yes. uh, tailoring our infection control uh, efforts to what the gene is. Definitely. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to uh, welcome uh, Dominic Dwyer. He's uh, 
He's in Sydney, so he's. Uh, I'm not sure if you're you're locked down in the northern suburbs, uh, Dominic, but uh, but I know I'm I'm listening for uh, family noise on the outside because I know you've uh, left your Christmas Eve festivities uh, probably on the other side of that door. But uh, so thanks for joining us. Um, Dominic's uh, a medical virologist and uh, an infectious disease physician and a clinical professor at Sydney University. He's director of the Public Health Pathology for New South Wales Health and he's director of the Institute of Clinical Pathology and Medical Research at Westmead Hospital. Uh, he's part of the university's Murray Bahia Institute of Emerging Infectious Diseases and Biosecurity. He assists state and national governments in planning for pandemic influenza and emerging infections and, and, and does various outbreak investigations. Most importantly though, today he's here as a member of the WHO team charged with investigating the origins of, of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we first met in, uh, in, a, in a Goan outbreak response uh, leadership training in 2009 in, in Laos. So uh, I always say the best, uh, the best thing about outbreaks is the people you meet. So uh, it's great to have you here, Dominic. Thank you very much, uh, Dale, and hello to everybody who's taking time out on a, on a Christmas Eve, all that shopping to be done and food to be prepared. Um, so, Dominic, uh, congratulations on being selected as a member of the team. Uh, I think it's congratulations, not commiserations. <laughs> Can you tell me how, uh, how the selection process went? So, look, WHO, uh, as I'm sure most people know, uh, investigate a lot of uh, outbreaks and indeed pandemics around the world. And they have a system for calling on partners, regional partners and country partners to help them with these outbreaks uh, from a range of different sources, be it uh, basic science to clinical epidemiology and, and infection control and everything in between. So go on the Global Outbreak Alert Response Network, uh, which Dale has had a very significant role in, um, uh, put out a call for people who could help them around investigating the origins of SARS coronavirus 2, which is obviously the cause of, of COVID-19 disease. Uh, and this uh, is, is actually a very natural response for WHO to do. Of course, it's taken on political connotations and so on uh, over and above that. But, but the core importance of finding out what's going on is something that I think we all believe in. So what are you going to be doing? What, or what have you done already? I think you've had some meetings. What do what the activities look like and, and what's the timeline going to be? So the activities mostly have been uh, talking, of course, trying to work out what the plan of activities will be. Uh, and uh, that's included both within the WHO group. Um, there's about 10 of us on the, the team, plus all the other WHO um, helpers and advisors and so on. Uh, and then, of course, meeting with Chinese counterparts at the moment at a senior level uh, in China. And there's a couple of ways the discussion's been going. One is, of course, clearly about the logistics and so on of getting there in the current environment of travel restrictions, uh, uh, but also what plans are for studies to be done to answer questions around the origin. Now, these sort of studies... Uh, 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 fall into a number of areas. One is around um, uh, uh, understanding the animal, uh, potential animal source of viruses. One is understanding how the spread occurred in Wuhan, indeed elsewhere in China, and for that matter, around the world, uh, and looking at the epidemiology, the virology, the animal interactions, all of those sorts of things. So the planning's around those main areas. And I guess you'll be looking to lots of countries to provide information on their serology from last year, various blood bank stores, I guess, wastewater management. There's lots of evidence trickling in on, uh, on positive antibodies and wastewater in, in other countries, yeah, even yeah. before Wuhan started. Well, that's right. So trickling in is a very good way to describe it. It's more than a trickle, I can tell you. <laughs> um, but really, the um, look, there's you know, many different ways of doing surveillance. You can do it in real time. Um, and Louisa gave a very nice uh, 
uh, outline of real, almost real-time genomic sequencing to help us here. Um, but there, there, there's other types of surveillance we need to understand. One is around wastewater and the excretion of the coronavirus in, in wastewater, and that can be a guide to unrecognised outbreaks. Uh, then, of course, there's sero surveys, in other words, looking for antibodies to the coronavirus in the blood of people. And there's different ways to construct those, and they vary in their value, uh, but that's another way. Uh, so, is, and then, of course, there's the old-fashioned clinical epidemiology of, you know, talking to people who've been infected, where they've been, what they've done, what sort of work that they do, all of those sorts of things. Uh, I think the important point to make here is that this is not about saying the origin is in China. To be honest, we don't know. We know that the outbreak amplified in Wuhan through the markets and so on, and then in the hospital system, and then spread around the world. It's not the same as saying it started there. And I think that's uh, an important part of the discussion. You know, did it come from Wuhan itself? Well, we don't know. Uh, did it come from elsewhere in China? We don't know. Did it come from neighbouring countries in China through things like uh, wild animal, um, you know, marketeering and and, uh, and, and so on. Um, and so we don't really know, or was it in fact uh, occurring overseas uh, outside of China in a manner that we didn't recognise? So I think all hypotheses are on the table here, and I think that's important. So Dominic, that's, that, that uh, comment would delight us scientists, I'm sure, uh, but there'd be many, uh, many non-scientist politicians that would refute that right from the outset, that would, uh, I, that would equate identification with origin. Uh, sure. so, so do you think it's possible to dissociate the science from the politics? Well, yeah, I hope so, because otherwise I'd be, you know, one would be nervous about taking this sort of work on. I mean, clearly WHO has, uh, as does any international organisation, have very important political considerations. And that, that doesn't, that, that applies whether you're in a war zone uh, or whether you're in a, an outbreak situation or all sorts of things. Uh, so I think one has to take the politics seriously. However, I'll be honest here, I'm not, a pay, I'm not paid enough to do the politics, so I'll stick to the science uh, and do the science as best, you know, and I think that's what the group is about, uh, doing the science in the best way possible and trying to put the politics aside, really, um, and, and try and be as open and transparent as possible uh, and, and uh, try and come up with what answers are possible and they may not be possible, of course, and kind of leave the politics aside. I think a lot of the poor politics is often follows poor science. So if the science and, and the answers are as good as they can be, then generally, and I, I know you can be wrong and so on, but generally the politics is better. That's fantastic. When we investigate outbreaks, the fundamental um, pretense has to be no blame. Uh, or yeah. else people just can't be honest. But there's a lot of people saying that because of the blame, there just can't be the, the transparency. Um, as soon as someone says, we want compensation for whoever started this. Um, so do you have any, any method to, to ensure transparency? Well, you know, that's a difficult question. I mean, my, my experience is, and I'm sure it's the same with, with you and uh, as well is that, and I know that when I worked in China with WHO during SARS in Beijing, um, the when you get down to talking to your peer group, your colleagues, uh, your infectious diseases physicians or virologists or epidemiologists, when you get down to talking to them on a on a trust, you know, trusted basis, that's when the answers tend to come up. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, if, you, if you're getting uh, information given to you by the people who don't generate the information, that's where things can be, I think, problematic. So I'm hoping that, that with this experience in, 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 in China, that we'll get to meet the people in Wuhan, the virologists and the epidemiologists and so on, and be able to talk to them uh, and get a sense of what they think. I mean, you know... I think people in China want to know what the answer is too. This is not just, you know, difficult politicians in certain big countries, you know, making a fuss about things. I think this is, I think everybody wants to know the answer and nobody wants to 
blame anyone. And the point of this is to not just to find the answer now uh, for this one, but in fact to be better prepared for the next one that's going to come, hopefully not in my lifetime, but the next pandemic that will occur. And, and again, as people would know, the improvement in openness in world information about infections and so on is not just driven by the technology like the whole genome sequencing, for example, um, but the openness of countries about what's going on in their countries and the international health regulations that came up after SARS made a big difference. Now, of course, we can do better. So maybe the information we get out of this uh, review will allow us to do it better the next time as well. And I think that's really important. Thanks, Dominic. You, mean, you mentioned pay. How much are you getting paid to do this? Uh, I'm not sure. It's not many shekels, I don't think. But uh, I'm not doing it for the pay. Of for course. the free trip. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, look, uh, Dominic, it's always a pleasure uh, spending time with you. I look forward to a a face-to-face -face beer next time uh, Next time uh, we can cross paths. But uh, yeah. thanks so much for giving up some of your Christmas Eve and, uh, and best of uh, luck to you and, and your whole family. Thanks Thank you very much, much, Dale. And again, it's great to be talking to people in Singapore. And I think everyone in Australia is very impressed with the way Singapore has managed a whole range of infectious diseases over many years. And I think that's a credit to the organisations there. So thank you. Thanks, Dominic. Now, uh, over to you, David. I think we've squeezed out uh, most most of your time, but uh, yeah, that's all right. I please, will please take uh, the liberty I, of going a bit long. Yeah, I appreciate. It. We will go a bit long, and thank you very much, Dale. So I'm going to talk about something that doesn't get much press time, uh, but uh, we'll see what we can do. Uh, let me just update everybody briefly about vaccine use that's currently either approved or uh, has emergency use authorization or in limited use. Uh, it, the, those that which are in bold uh, and shadowed are the ones that uh, uh, there are advanced purchase orders for Singapore and obviously Pfizer BioNTech uh, has already arrived on Monday evening. Uh, but you can see there's quite a number of countries there, but there's a number uh, in there uh, that are already in use. Um, and, and so uh, by the time we update this uh, next month, uh, this list will have grown quite a bit. Uh, there's a bracket with a little asterisk next to AstraZeneca Oxford and uh, Sputnik V. It's because, and I'll, uh, I'll speak about this a little later uh, in my brief talk, uh, they're, they're going to be used together. They've got a trial starting later this month to use them together. Those that are in red are the mRNA vaccines. Those that are in light blue are the adenovirus vaccines. And those that are in green are the inactivated vaccines. So, um, some of these topics have been spoken to rather extensively in the press and elsewhere, and so I'm only going to speak to them very briefly uh, so that we can get to this. This is going to be a lightning round like in a quiz show. Uh, should we be comfortable with Pfizer's and Moderna's safety data? The answer is yes. That's the short answer. Uh, no vaccine or no drug is without its uh, potential issues, but one always weighs the risks versus benefits, and the risks far and away extraordinarily outweigh uh, the risk, whether it's we're talking about the individual or to society. Um, uh, why were no anaphylactoid reactions reported in phase three? Well, uh, both Pfizer and Moderna excluded patients who had had uh, severe reactions, uh, either to components of the vaccines uh, or other severe reactions, and that's why. There have been up to, uh, and not all the cases have been investigated thoroughly, eight anaphylactoid uh, reactions associated with uh, Pfizer, um, uh, Pfizer's and uh, BioNTech's vaccine, uh, two in Alaska, two in uh, the UK and others uh, in the US. Um, and these were, a number of those were in people who already carried EpiPens. These were period, people with severe reactions. So uh, it is uh, recommended uh, to give these vaccines in people who do not have, uh, who have not had uh, severe allergic reactions. Uh, because in doing so, there's a, quite a number of people who have had mild reactions to medications. Uh, we would be denying uh, them the opportunity to have benefit from the vaccine. Uh, what's to be learned from post-jab surveillance? Uh, well, we'll learn about the longevity of uh, antibody, neutralizing antibody. We'll learn about the longevity of T-cell response. Um, uh, we'll learn about uh, side effects uh, that may appear late, although the overwhelming majority of, uh, of uh, reactions that occur to vaccine occur in the first two months. 
uh, but we'll, there are measures in place to uh, look for rare uh, events that might occur over the first couple of years. It's done by a variety of ways. It can be done by the electronic medical record. Uh, it can be done by a surveillance system that requires uh, clinicians, or healthcare workers to report in. It can be done with uh, patients uh, uh, when they get their vaccine certificate uh, electronically, they can reply through there. And it'll also remind, remind them when their uh, second dose is due. Uh, some vaccines have had limited release uh, data before the, uh, excuse me, limited release before the phase three data, uh, which is absolutely right. And, and um, why did they do that? Well, they did it for a variety of reasons. Um, some were for uh, expediency, some were for geopolitical purposes, some for, for national pride. Um, some were for the good reason of trying to help other people because many of these drugs went to um, uh, low income and middle income countries or will go to low income and middle in income countries. But the problem is by doing so in this manner, um, it, it uh, creates concerns about the potential for side effects that uh, have not been disclosed. So there may be an issue with um, uh, vaccine acceptance in those situations. So that's why everyone's eager to see the phase three trials and some of these drugs that have had early release, uh, obviously not in Singapore. Uh, what's to be learned from, oh, excuse me, uh, some vaccines have had limited uh, release. Oh, excuse me, I apologize, I'm repeating myself. There we go. Um, which countries will receive the vaccine as it becomes available? And um, this is a little graph uh, that uh, a little table that shows you vaccine pre-orders. So you can see uh, certain countries such as Canada, uh, they have pre-orders. Now, not all of these drugs have been approved. Not all of this is Moderna or Pfizer, uh, but they have pre-orders that would give them essentially 600% uh, vaccine, six times what their population requires. And you can see going down there on that list, uh, those countries that uh, have at least 100% vaccine that they have uh, advanced purchase orders. In Singapore, uh, PM Lee has told us that if all goes according to plan, we'll have enough vaccines for everyone uh, by the third quarter 2021. Uh, Singapore has put in at least a billion, if not more, toward vaccines. Uh, obviously, Pfizer BioNTech has been approved. Um, Moderna and Sinovac, there are early, uh, uh, I mean, so there are advanced purchase orders. They have not been approved as yet. Arcturus, which is uh, co developed locally, uh, there have been a, 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 a advanced purchase orders as well, um, but that has not uh, released a phase three data and that's expected in the first quarter of uh, 2021. Uh, and then the COVAX facility will be an opportunity to get drug as well. So let's just speak about an interesting aspect about uh, vaccines, something that we may hear about more in the future. And, and this isn't to address the issue of not enough vaccine. This is trying to maximize what benefit we can get from the vaccine. So what it is, is uh, we give a, the initial vaccine uh, with one vaccine platform, one vaccine type, uh, such as uh, uh, Pfizer. Uh, and then we give the second one uh, with a different uh, vaccine. It could be the same platform, just a different uh, uh, vaccine, a, a different mRNA vaccine, or it could be for in this case, uh, in January, they're gonna start a trial uh, using uh, uh, the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca, the, the adenovirus uh, vaccine the chimp adenovirus vaccine, as a way to try to maximize immunologic response, maximize the capacity to deal with things um, uh, such as an in incomplete response or someone who may respond to one vaccine better than another, or potentially to deal with the vaccine um, uh, or, or uh, virus variants. You can see also at the bottom, AstraZeneca is also working with uh, uh, the uh, Gamalea uh, makers of Sputnik V uh, as well. So that'll be uh, two different adenovirus vaccines. Well, those who are SARS-2, uh, uh, excuse me, SARS-CoV-2 infected need vaccination, uh, definitely. Uh, vaccine, uh, excuse me, a natural infection does not give you necessarily a reliable response. We've learned that from monitoring people over time. Uh, vaccine gives a, a, a uh, determined dose a, that we know is, evokes a, a, a excellent response. Uh, and so it'll be very beneficial to those people to get vaccinated. They won't be top of the list uh, in priority wise, but they will eventually uh, get vaccinated. It'll be in everyone's interest. Uh, can a vaccinated person infect others? Yes, uh, we know the vaccine is uh, excellent. 
at preventing symptoms. We know it's extremely good at preventing severe disease. Um, but we, we, there is limited data from Moderna and from uh, AstraZeneca suggesting that it actually may give sterilizing immunity in a percentage of people. That is not known. So until we have an idea uh, that these people who have been vaccinated cannot infect others, we need to maintain our, our guard, maintain our uh, social distancing, mask wearing, hand hygiene, et cetera. Is it ethical to maintain a placebo arm uh, now that we have uh, vaccines that have shown uh, to be efficacious? Very complicated question. Uh, phase three trials are set up for maximizing social good, finding out information and looking uh, to, to get the most out of these uh, trials that'll help society. Uh, patients, or excuse me, subjects who enroll in these uh, have informed consent. Uh, I, uh, investigation review boards review the informed consent, review the trial to make sure it's ethical. And there are data safety monitoring boards monitoring this. So the answer is in general, if people are informed, peop, uh, patients, excuse me, subjects have accept known risks for the potential benefit to themselves uh, and to society by doing so. Now, that being said, once you know that you have an e efficacious vaccine, you're ethically obliged to notify uh, the patient that there is a effective vaccine. People uh, or subjects that are in these trials are capable of, of saying, I, I no longer wish to participate. I wanna be unblinded to find out if I received placebo or vaccine. So currently regulatory agencies are looking at this. FDA met either a week ago or this week, uh, and they're talking about a variety of strategies to be able to salvage the information one needs from the placebo arms to test both efficacy and uh, safety, uh, but, uh, but be able to uh, be, do the right thing for patients. Why couldn't they be uh, released earlier? We had them in February, right? They started making these vaccines. Well, the reason is you got to assure safety and efficacy. This is a no brainer, but typically vaccines, all of those things in the little cartoon there were, were sequential. Now they're being done in parallel uh, and it requires enormous investment to build manufacturing capacity early before you even have a product it requires uh, a great, risk. Uh, some of that risk has been mitigated by foundations and, and trust funds and, and, and countries. Others have been taken on by the uh, companies themselves. But if you can truncate all of that stuff and do it in parallel, uh, then you can do this safely uh, to find efficacy. And obviously, it's been 10 months. Pretty phenomenal. This is a bit more esoteric. Should intellectual property rights be waived? Well, that's, it's not esoteric if you're a third world country, uh, excuse me, if you're a, a country that doesn't have the resources to be able to get access to vaccines, drugs, or related tests. You wanna be able to produce these things locally, but you just can't afford to pay for them. So from your perspective, uh, yes, uh, we, they should be waived. Uh, the World Trade Organization should waive them. Uh, you can also say that, gee, a lot of these vaccines, tests, drugs were developed with public money from governments, from foundations who are looking for the, the overall good. If you're the company's perspective, you go, look, I'm taking a risk um, and I, I innovate because there's the, the, the hope for profit someday. Maybe not now, but it's someday in the future. So you can certainly understand their perspective. This is a complex little... Uh, uh, not that it'll be difficult to crack, but it's uh, uh, being uh, addressed currently. Is reinfection of a concern? Well, not really. Uh, this is an interesting website. Uh, it's a BNO a news reinfection tracker, and it uh, basically looks for uh, published acceptable data uh, to document that people have had more than one infection. And they do this usually by sequencing the, the isolate they have, not usually, they always do. And you can see there, there's been 31 cases they've, they've felt like they've definitively identified, two deaths. Uh, the average interval between the first infection and the second infection was 80 days. Most of these people had negative swabs and, and, and re resolution of symptoms and were better before a second episode. Um, and there's links to the details that support some of these things. But the reality is it's extraordinarily rare events. 77 million people have been confirmed worldwide, but the reality is that there's been many multiples of that actually infected when you look at the serology data as Dale uh, discussed earlier. Um, and so that's at least less than one reinfection per three million infected. So it's a very, very rare event. So smart certification, 
uh, is, I believe, my final slide. Uh, it's coming. It's got a couple of other names. Uh, but this is documenting that you, you've had vaccine certification. Currently, we have a uh, requirement with uh, international travel with regard to yellow fever. Uh, this may very well be the second one that comes along. And it's going to be important. It's going to be important so that we can open up uh, travel for business people. Uh, it's going to be important so that we can have uh, uh, vacations and uh, we tourism uh, that uh, so many countries depend on to survive, but it does come at a cost, uh, and that cost is the concerns about uh, uh, privacy, uh, bit hacking, about uh, about uh, uh, people uh, putting in false uh, documentation. It's about people who don't have uh, smartphones. Uh, who may not have access to this and, and not be able to have a digital vaccination certificate, uh, and people who can't get vaccinated, whether they're pregnant or whether they're pregnant or whether they're less than 16 or profoundly immunocompromised or have had anaphylaxis, uh, those people there's concerns about bias against them with regard to travel, to work, all sorts of things. So this is a, a project that World uh, Health Organization is undertaking and seeking input. Uh, for both designing platforms that will be uh, universally accepted, because it's got to be accepted on both sides, both the where you're departing from and where you're arriving to, and uh, how to address these issues of privacy and bias. So with that, thank you. Very good, David. <laughs> Around the world in five <laughs> <Santa>. minutes, Santa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure we've got time for questions, actually. Yep. David, what do you think? Okay, I think you're right, Dale. Uh, I'll uh, then we'll we'll move to the the little closing segment here. I'll, I'll ask Louise if she has any closing thoughts. I think that you know th there's a similar uh, kind of um, message that you know that's come from all the segments today, and really it's also what I tried to emphasize on is that you know no matter what variants or you know mutations or you um, you know kind of nuances in the in the co in COVID-19 itself we're talking about, um, really all these public health measures are that we've emphasized are the same. And you know, with that, I think that's the most important thing that, you know, if uh, each individual can help and play their role, then you know, we still have hope of containing the spread of the virus. Uh, I'd like to go a little bit more personal and just say this has been uh, a hell of a year, a hell of a uh, webinar series. Um, We'll be back next year, obviously, but uh, we, we've got a, there, there's, there's still over 500 people uh, watching now and uh, from, from up to 70 different countries, I think. And we, we really appreciate the support. We, it's, it's our privilege to actually put these shows together for everybody. So uh, please stay on for the end. We've, we've actually got a, a news scoop, a um, couple of videos there, which, uh, which have got some important information. Just take a couple of minutes. Um, but uh, personally, I'd like to say uh, season's greetings to everyone, uh, wh whatever your background, and uh, enjoy the next, uh, the next week or so. Thanks, David. Thanks, Dale. Uh, and it leads me to thank uh, Dominic, Dale, and Louisa for sharing their wisdom, insight, and enthusiasm. Uh, just to remind you, next week's episode will be on the 28th of January. We'll return to our normal time, which is 7 p.m. Uh, please join us then. Uh, don't Again, don't forget to submit your videos, uh, your, your pandemic song of the month, as well as questions and topics for us. You'll find the URL in the chat box. It'll come up shortly at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if, you're, if your video is selected, we'll be happy to uh, acknowledge you. Um, the uh, chat box will be open for about 10 minutes after the show closes. Uh, until next month, uh, stay safe, uh, wear your mask, wash your hands. Uh, our uh, Pandemic Song of the Month expresses the feelings we all share from the release of effective vaccines. It's Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles, circa 1969. That'll be followed by uh, two videos uh, from uh, Dale's archives that he's introduced. And thank you for watching. Enjoy and good night. Here comes the sun. As Minister for Foreign Affairs, we've been working on the Santa Claus issue for a number of weeks now. Um, and it's important to say to all children in the country um, that we regard um, Santa Claus's travels uh, as essential travel for essential purposes. And therefore, he is exempt 
uh, from the, the need to self-quarantine for 14 days and should be able to come in and out of Irish airspace and indeed in and out of Irish homes uh, without having to restrict his movement. I can tell you that Santa Claus um, is immune to this virus. We had a, a brief chat with him uh, and he's doing very well. Uh, Mrs. Claus is doing very well and they're very busy right now. And we have heard from a number of uh, um, leaders uh, across the world who have told us that they have uh, relaxed the quarantine measures for Santa to enter the airspace. So he will be able to travel in and out of the airspace and be able to deliver presents to children. But I think it is very important that all children of the world understand that physical distancing by Santa Claus and also of the children themselves must be strictly enforced. So it is really important that the children of the world um, you know, still listen to their moms and dads and their guardians and make sure that they go to bed early on Christmas Eve. Uh, but Santa will be able to travel around the world uh, to deliver presents.